Tell Us About Yourself is sponsored by BonusRound.ca, streaming Canada's classic game shows on demand. Dive into the golden age of television with thousands of episodes of Canadian series that defined an era from anywhere in the world, all for just $1.99 a month. From iconic shows like Let's Make a Deal and Definition to cult classics like Bumper Stumpers and The Mad Dash, BonusRound.ca brings you timeless entertainment that's fun, enlightening, and affordable. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, relive the magic of Canadian television history. Subscribe now at bonusround.ca for $1.99 and turn every night into game show night. And by The Inn at Leola Village. Nestled in the heart of picturesque Pennsylvania, The Inn at Leola Village is a sanctuary of luxury and relaxation. Indulge in the timeless beauty of their historic suites, each meticulously designed to transport you to a bygone era of elegance and grace. Experience the culinary delights of their award-winning Italian restaurant, where every dish is a masterpiece crafted from the finest local ingredients. From romantic getaways to corporate retreats, the Inn at Leola Village offers a haven for every occasion. Unwind at the spa, stroll through the lush gardens, and let the stress of everyday life melt away. Make your reservation today at theinnatleolavillage.com or call the front desk at area code 717-656-7002. The Inn at Leola Village, an oasis of luxury. Tell Us About Yourself, Conversations with Game Show Contestants is produced in partnership with the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. One of the largest history museums in the United States and one of the leading museums serving families with highly interactive exhibits and programs. Since 1968, the Strong Museum has been dedicated to exploring the ways in which play encourages learning, creativity, and discovery, and how it illuminates cultural history. And their National Archives of Game Show History. Founded by industry veterans Bob Bowden and Howard Blumenthal, the archive is home to thousands of artifacts representing over 80 years of broadcasting, including props, set designs, video interviews with game show professionals, and other iconic elements from the history of television at play. For more information about the National Archives of Game Show History or the Strong National Museum of Play, visit museumofplay.org or call area code 585-263-2700. Yourself, would you? Tell us something about you. For any new viewers, won't you tell us again about yourself? We've met before, but let's meet again. Tell us about yourself. What else can you tell us about yourself? Perhaps you'd fill us in again and tell us about yourself. I'm Christian Carrion. My guest tonight is Kurt Kaplan. In 1977, after several rounds of auditions, Kurt and his friends made their first appearance on The Gong Show. They wore long underwear and basketball shorts, flopped around the floor for 30 seconds, and subsequently achieved daytime TV stardom. Kurt, welcome to the show. Tell us about yourself. My name is Kurt Kaplan. I was uh, born and raised in Southern California in the San Fernando Valley. 
worked for the National Weather Service for many years, also in the publishing business. I retired a few years ago and moved up to just north of Seattle a few years ago. A couple of friends from high school, um, basically, I was just at a friend's house watching the gong show. We called the phone number. Didn't think it would go through. It did. Spoke to uh, whoever answered the phone, and we said we had a comedy act, not knowing what we were going to do. They asked how many people. I said three. They said, great, be here in two days at you know 1 p.m. Click. So that's how it all started. And then the worm came after that. When I talk to other people who like game shows, love game shows as much as I do, the 70s sort of hold the special significance because there were so many different game shows on the air. It was sort of this this renaissance of this format. Were you a fan of game shows growing up in the 70s? Yeah, um, I was, as a matter of fact. And, and I also did a few other game shows. And my wife now, who was my girlfriend at the time, she did a few game shows as well. Uh, back in the uh, 70s, actually more in the early 80s um, with that. But yes, I definitely was a game show uh, fanatic. Excellent. So which game shows were those, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, well, I always love the match game. Um, it's just fun. Even now when I look at the uh, the game show network and looking back at some of the shows, just what they <laughs> what they could get away with then they can get away with now. So that kind of makes it kind of fun to watch back. But um, yeah, match game was something I enjoyed. Um Let's see here. Um, you know, let's make a deal back in the day. I, I enjoyed too. Um, and the price is right with Bob Barker was always fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just, I look back on those shows in the seventies and they were so colorful and, 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 and loud and, uh, and, and experimental in some ways. I mean, there were so many different shows on the air in that decade. It was, you know, they were just throwing stuff against the wall to see what stuck, but it was so much fun to watch. You know, they had shows like, the Price is Right, that would be on half a century later, but there were other shows, you know, that were on for a few weeks, little curiosities here and there. They just tried so much, and I really yeah. admired that kind of era of television. Yeah, Tattletales. I mean, you know, things, just they were just kind of fun to watch. I mean, you some of these older, you know, these, these actors and actresses. Uh, Tattletales was always kind of an interesting show. Yeah, Tattletales was a fun show. I It took me a long time to learn how that show worked because it was sort of it was sort of like the newlywed game with celebrity couples and each section of the audience was playing uh was kind of playing along the celebrity was playing for that section and they would get cut a check on the way out of the studio if that team won everybody in oh. the audience in that section would get a check up you know right on their way out the door which i i had no That's idea right. yeah depending on the color they were sitting in there were three different colors red uh, yellow and banana if i remember no red Blue and banana, exactly. if I remember correctly. Right. <laughs> right. The banana section. Exactly. Yep, that's right. That's right. So tell me, Kurt, how your life uh, intertwines with that world of game shows. Were you somebody who wanted to be on television, wanted to be your performer? How did that sort of materialize for you? Um, you know, I, I, I don't think so necessarily. Um, I was a bit of an extrovert when I was younger, um, but it was basically... Um, just, you know, I enjoyed watching those shows. Uh, I played, you know, I played piano as a kid. So I was performing in front of some people now and then. Um, my brother was a musician. So I, I was kind of around that area growing up in the San Fernando Valley back in the 70s. My brother played with a lot of uh, big people and named people and stuff. So I kind of grew up in that area. I remember going to a restaurant as a kid with my parents at Mateo's and I believe it was Westwood and, you know, Jerry Lewis. And he had like, seemed like he had like 10 kids sitting there and he, he was counting down and he counted my head like I was one of his kids walking by. Um, it was just an interesting time growing up in the 70s out in the, the San Fernando Valley in Southern California, as it was. Sure. All these little brushes with stardom. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of fun. And, you know, when people talk about the gong show these days, it tends to get lost in the conversation just how popular the gong show was. I mean, I would compare, and, and I wasn't around in the 70s, of course, but from hearing about it, it sounds almost like what happened with American Idol, how it became this massive show. Everybody was watching it. Everybody was fascinated by it. And then even local businesses were having their own, you know, American Idol night, their own talent night. And it was the same in the 70s and early 80s. I mean, there were gong show nights at different bars, you know, all over the country. It was just so, such a massively popular show. How how clued in on that aspect of the gong show were you uh, when you decided to audition? 
Well, we knew it was a we knew it was a fun big show. Um, yeah. You know, we we wanted to go on. We figured it'd be fun to get on there, knowing we'd probably get gunged. Um, but the procedure, how it all came about, was really interesting. And after after it was over, I think, like you mentioned, I didn't realize how big the after effects were going to be. I mean, years later, 10, 20 years later, we still, you know, I'll still hear about it from people um, about the about the worm since we were on like 11 times uh, called back. And then we did the Chuck Barris Ra Ra show, which we got edited out of both times that we recorded it. Um, but yeah, when we when we definitely did it, we knew it was a popular show and we thought, yeah, let's just try this thing called the worm. And we came up with it literally overnight. Um and we practice it, and then we we went in front of the. Uh, it's like an incognito restaurant that we went to for our first audition in Hollywood. And I remember there was a cameraman there, and then we went and did our act in front of him just to record it. And when I, if you remember the worm, I kind of dropped first, and then the other two behind me would drop, and we had to do it before thirty seconds, otherwise we definitely would have got gone. And the cameraman was laughing. He was laughing so much that the camera was shaking and we couldn't even get through. When, when I fell down, he was laughing so hard that the other two, we just couldn't even finish the act. It was, we thought we screwed up. Um, and he was laughing. He said, do it again and just, you know, try to get through it. And literally it seemed like three days later, we got a call back to do it in front of Chuck Barris. So we practiced, you know, to make sure that we did a good, you know, did a good job <laughs> as, as bad as of an act it was. And we got there and did it in front of him. And we literally, we booked the show. It seemed like within a day afterwards, we booked this um, for our first uh, first show. What a rush. And Kurt, oh. if you don't mind me asking, tell me how how did the act come about? Who yeah. uh, who was the lead worm? Who thought of this whole thing? And, yeah, and so, it just, like, what was the origin of that? Yeah. Um, so when I was 16... Um, I went with a couple of friends and we took a van and we sold we sold paintings across the country. We were up in uh, Vancouver, Washington one night at a party. And one of my friends, he just started getting down, having a seizure. He, he called it the worm. And I, you know, I didn't think much of it. It was kind of funny. Um, and just that kind of just kind of sat back. And then when we got through on the phone to uh, to get on to audition, we said, you know, I, it was just it was me who came up with that. And I was with one of my friends at his house, Jeff Linden. And we said, you know what, well, let's try the worm. You know, we'll do something. And I played piano. So I made up a four chord song and we made up the lyrics. And then we had to get one more. We wanted three people on there. So we ended up uh, calling another friend, Greg Chickman. And we had our three guys and we practiced it literally for a day. And then uh, we auditioned, like I said, we, we thought we screwed up, but they called us back. And uh, we did it in front of Chuck Barris. So it, it really happened overnight. I mean, we, I saw that I saw the worm, you know, at a, some somebody's house at, at a party in Vancouver, Washington, of all things. And then we brought it back and um, we, you know, we did it in front of Chuck Barris. I remember hitting my head on the ground pretty hard, too, when we were doing it. Um, <laughs> Which I'm sure oh, he loved. <laughs> I had a I had Jean, you know, a few episodes in. Jean Jean fell on my leg, and, and I literally couldn't feel my leg for about a minute. It was Jean Jean the dancing machine. I saw him in the clip that you sent me because I think the one that you sent me and you were the one in the blue shorts in that clip, if I remember yes, correctly. That's yeah, right. I remember it was I guess the second to last episode of the series, and it looked like the entire orchestra, just everybody associated with the show, just came out and started doing the worm with you. Yeah, it was a bunch of the contestants. It, it was a weird show because he brought back some of the old favorites, and maybe there was two or three new acts in that show who happened to all get gone. So, there, so yeah, everyone came out and they just kind of, you know, ransacked the place, and everyone's on the ground doing the worm, and there was no winner. And if you notice, we're trying to grab the trophy, a few of us, since nobody won, and uh, we can hear someone say, "Get off of, get off of, uh, of Chuck. His back is bad, or whatever." So we kind of like regress from doing that because we were trying to get the trophy from him. On that, right, last right, right. So, yeah. So, um, go ahead. So tell me what you remember about the first time you were on the Gong Show because you mentioned you were on the show several times. Tell yeah. me about that first appearance. What do you sure. remember about that experience? And did you win? Yeah, so we we were in there. So they we got there and they you know were dressed up in our outfits and our long underwear, and we, they put us in a room with a bunch of other contestants. They were probably filming four shows that day, maybe five shows. So there's a whole bunch of people in the like they put you in a room, they feed you, 
you can't go to the bathroom unless they take you somewhere to go. I remember it was a pretty big deal. And the one thing I remember that was kind of fun, the, the people that were just kind of having fun doing stupid acts were really kind of cool. And some of them that were doing serious acts were just really bizarre. Um, I remember that sticking out in my head, just, in, just how I, how I saw those people. It was just such a strange group of people. So eclectic in there. Um, well, that's true of the gong show itself. I think it was made yeah. up of like two groups of people. It was people that weren't really taking themselves seriously and went up there to kind of make a fool of themselves in the most positive and fun and joyous way possible. And yes. then it was people who thought this, you know, the gong show was going to be a step towards stardom and they treated it as such. And like you said, kind of maybe took themselves a little too seriously. Yeah. And it was funny when they, when the, and you can see that when they were performing and it wasn't working out, boy, they, instead of having fun with it, they got really upset. Uh, and, and, you know, Chuck uh, Barris was just great at, you know, like interacting with these people. I mean, for the good or for the worse, it was pretty fun. It was entertaining, to say the least. Sure. And Chuck Barris is a name that I have this eternal fascination with. I'm just so fascinated with the way he created shows and just how he tapped into what TV viewers wanted to see, whether they realized it or not. Tell me what you remember about Chuck Barris at that point, because up to this point, you'd only really seen him in the audition and yeah, you dealt and, and with him one, in that first episode. Yeah, and the one thing about the audition, I remember when we did it in front of him, he was he was very low key. Um, his personality was so subdued. I mean, he was just so like he hasn't slept in three days. I, I remember that, that he just seemed so tired. And we, right. so we did our act and he, he was real nice and pleasant and everything. But, the, you know, you, from what you see on TV and from what you saw there, it was a complete, it was like almost like a 180. That's um, interesting. It makes sense because at that time, I'm thinking about 1977, he has the gong show on the air. He has the dating game in syndication, the newlywood game in syndication. I'm pretty sure the uh, treasure hunt, uh, the show with the check and the big boxes, I, and you have I to find where the check is. Yeah, that's on the air. He has so much stuff kind of in the fire around that time, and then stuff to come. I mean, Three's a Crowd was a couple of years later, and who knows what, you know, all these producers for every show that they have on the year, they have two that they're trying to get on that don't go anywhere. So it's right. very interesting. He must have been so spread so thin, you know? Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you, when the show, when the gong show was being filmed, oh my God. I mean, he was just like on. He was on. I mean, he just was so much hype. It was so he was so hyper, right? Um, the whole series. It was just crazy. Yeah. So, and um, as the years go on in that show, I mean, that energy comes through. If you look at an sh- episode from maybe the first few weeks of the Gong Show, and then look at you know around the time you the Worms made their last appearance. I mean, even the audience is just is is off the wall. It's almost well, you know out of control. The reason why the Worm worked is because Chuck Barris, in his wisdom, would say one more time after we know. We thought we'd get gone, but we made it. And then he said one more time. And all three of us were kind of athletic guys at school. You know, we played sports. I've never been so tired in my life. After the third time, he would say one more time after we're having the seizures on the ground. So, you know, you can see how exhausted we were. But I think because he did that, the one more time routine made, made it kind of popular. Um and we didn't get gung, but and we scored a twenty-eight. Um, we had the highest score at the time. It was uh, Artie. It was Artie Johnson, J.P. Morgan, who was you know he, she loved it, and then Mabel Mabel King, who was on that show. What's happening? Right. Um, and the score was twenty-eight a, out of thirty because each of them could yeah. give you a score of zero to ten. She gave us quote a wormy eight. That's what <laughs> she said. Right. And, we got, and we got tens from Artie Johnson and from J.P. Morgan. And we, you know, we thought we'd get gone, quite frankly. It was just that kind of an act. We knew that going in. Sure, but sure, it, sure. So, so what's interesting is, so, we, were, you know, we didn't win. Somebody, you know, a guy with a guitar came out and sang and, and got the 30 points. And that's fine. You know, we figured that was going to happen. Uh, but we didn't expect to score so high, whatever. It was kind of interesting. So we get home from it, and literally, like, I think a day or two later, we get a call to do the night version. Um, so we're like, this is kind of cool. We didn't expect that. And, you know, we go back to do the night version, and it's the same studio. It was right next to Johnny Carson's studio at NBC. Uh-huh. And um, same kind of a thing happened. We ended up scoring, I think, 28. Um, it was like, I guess, a 10 and, and two nines. 
And um, I can't remember exactly who was on the who was on the show that night um, <laughs> as a panel. I know J.P. Morgan was. And we again we scored really high, and it was again he did the one more time thing. So all of a sudden that was kind of catching on. It was just you know people enjoyed seeing us like completely winded, and then getting up and doing it again over and over. And I remember on the first time we came out, we were so off tune and like we were not with the beat. It was just like so overwhelming uh, at the time. And we, I mean, the X sucked anyway. That was the whole point of it. But we really sucked that first time out. And that towards the end of like the ninth and tenth appearance, you know, we were having such a good time. We were in sync, you know, we were with the beat and stuff. And um, but along the way, what happened after the second episode? Uh, again, we didn't win, but we scored high. We got called again that that they said, hey, we want you to do a few episodes on the next one, but we weren't going to be rated. So we had to join AFTRA, which, you know, we didn't expect to do. Um, so we joined AFTRA. We ended up filming like three or four shows, like of the five shows that week, we did like two or three of them or something like that. And we weren't rated, but all of a sudden we became kind of like these, you know, these, these acts that came back once in a while, like, you know, well, Obviously, the Gene Gene and the Unknown Comic were on a lot more. Right. We were getting and now calls. you're union television performers. Yeah, we became That's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it was like, like so bizarre. It was weird. The first one or two episodes we did were a lot different than the last few that we did. I mean, and it wasn't that big of an area of a window, but you can tell the difference. I mean, you know, like the claps and everything, the fake claps and the people are clapping like crazy out in the audience and you know when chuck barris would clap and they would mimic it that's right that's right they would clap along with him i wonder if yeah. he hated that i don't know because then he would fake you he would fake it like he would clap just to you know the people would clap and he didn't and stuff sometimes right 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 um but i'm trying so the other interesting thing was like after the se like several appearances you know we would be out in the back like if we were going on we'd be in the kind of the back area where like nbc had these uh tours of you know people can see in the Johnny Carson studio and they can walk around, whatever else, and there'd be people taking them. And all of a sudden they would say, Hey, they're, hey, they're the worms. <laughs> so, so that was kind of fun. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Us. Yeah. They would recognize us. And then to make it even more bizarre, when animal house came out, they did what they, you know, the gator, when they went down during the toga dance and they, right. And they right. Right. The worm. They literally did the worm. And we and we were getting fan mail, by the way, too. That was the other fun thing. They would forward us fan mail that we got from the the Gong Show, like how the act, whatever. It was it was just so weird. Wow, um, that's a very so surreal experience. How does that is. kind of how does that kind of attention sit with you? Some people, I imagine. Well, I, I've talked to so many people for this show, and 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 contestants who sort of become famous from their appearances to varying degrees of of fame. Some people right. are super uncomfortable with it. Some people revel in it. Where, where did you fit in there? We kind of reveled in it because we knew that it was a stupid act. We did not take ourselves seriously. Right. So if people were having fun with it, we certainly were. Um, you know, it, it, we we knew we knew we had no talent. I mean, that's the that was the beauty of it. It was the, it was like the it was like the quintessential gong show act to me. Um, what we did because it was just stupid, but it it, it clicked. Um, the LA Times did, it's funny, the LA Times did a, a, an article, and I can't find it now, but they rated the top five acts on the Gong Show. And we were cracking up because I don't think we were not even remotely up on the top list, but but on their list, we were number three. Um, we were, it was weird, Gene Gene and the Unknown Comic were one and two, we were three, and then Oingo Boingo was four. We were actually more talented than Oingo Boingo, according oh, to Oh, amazing. They made so many appearances on the Gong Show. Yeah, so that that was great. I mean, that was kind of fun to see that. And so as I got you know older, like even 20 or 30 years, you know, sometimes the stuff would come up like, hey, these guys were on the world. It was just weird. Like, uh, I, I don't know. But here's the weird part. There was a Gong Show fan page um, that I don't see on the line anymore. And so one day I found it and I went on there and I, you know, I kind of wrote, Hey, I'm Kurt, you know, I was with the worms and we had so many people like react to it. And I, and I said, Hey, if anyone happens to have any videos, cause we, we couldn't find our, we couldn't find any videos of it or I lost whatever one or two I had. And I'm not kidding. Literally like two days later, somebody sent me like four or five of the videos they recorded of it. I, mean, I, I, I don't I, I believe you completely because the oh. game show fandom 
when it comes to attention to detail and when it comes to meticulous collecting of this of like of this material it's unbelievable my researcher for the podcast his name is chuck um he helps me like i'll I'll tell him the name of a contestant that i'm interviewing and he will go into his archive and just pull out any footage that he has of that person he's he's like a savant when it comes to just the names of contestants and it's it's oh it's 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 really like it's it's unbelievable he has something like you know six or eight thousand episodes of game shows maybe even more um yeah but yeah, I, I'm I'm I am uh, amazed, but not surprised that somebody had your appearances. And to me, that's like it's part of the magic of TV. And I think that it's part of the magic that I didn't realize until I made appearances on shows, until I got a a, a working idea of how the other side of TV works that you don't see at home. You know, you do things on TV, and even even this that we're doing now, this podcast, you. You know, you make media, you put it out there and you don't know who it's reaching. You don't know what effect it has on the people that are seeing it. You don't know where it's going. And it takes that sort of recognition and, you know, to realize that, wow, this is a really sort of far reaching medium. You have no idea how far it can go. Right. Oh, yeah. It, it just it, it kind of just blew my mind how things just panned out. And we we even did a, a benefit for a high school in Pasadena where they did a gong show and we were asked to come perform there and we did and it was it was great we, there was a big grand piano and the grand piano the top of it went onto the stage like it, like you could like worm from the stage onto the piano and we did that and it was just it was great it was i, I remember it was south pasadena high school maybe a few years after we did the gong show and stuff and it was just crazy it was just so much fun unbelievable and yeah to move forward and all of a sudden um I got a somehow somebody reached me from the Don Blue version of the Gone Show um, back, you know, in the mid '80s, and they got hold of us as the Worms, and you know, we're now out of high school, we're all doing our thing now, and um, so they said, "Hey, would you guys like to do our show?" We're, you know, just you know, like a classic old Gone Show act, and I said, "Yeah, let me talk to the guys," and I'm in Southern California still. The other two guys are up in Northern California, but we were able to go on the show, and the funny thing is. Uh, and we had a great panel. We had we had um, Weird Al Yankovic, so we knew we would do well with him. And then we had Stacy Q, who was a one-hit wonder. Um, she had one song out, um, something of heart. I can't think of the title of it. Um, anyway, and then we had a couple of Dodgers who were sharing a seat. So, so we went out there and and uh, we did our act, and we got a ten from Weird Al. We got a a nine or a 10 from the Dodgers. And then Stacy Q gave us a two and the shots. Oh, that was your song. Two of hearts. Two of hearts. That, two of hearts. <laughs> that was you're right. Two hearts. So she gave us a two and, and uh, we looked over or I, I, and we watched the show. The one of one of the worms, Greg Chickman gets this look like he's upset, which is hilarious in itself. I mean, like I said, our act is so stupid. Um, so the ironic part is we tied with a comedian guy who I've seen periodically with a 21 and it was a tie. And then the audience gave it to us. So we actually won the trophy. Um, we won the show, which, you know, didn't expect oh, that. Oh, that had to have felt so great. I mean, a decade later, I imagine the physicality yeah. is like maybe a slight bit more challenging <laughs> in the eighties than it was, you know, 10 years prior. Oh, and, and again, another weird thing is. My wife and I, we, you know, we were into dogs and we had corgis um, and we were going to somewhere, I think in Anaheim or somewhere out there to go meet with some a, a couple of people to look at the corgi or whatever it was. We walk in the house and on the walls are pictures of Stacy Q. And I'm like, this is weird. I go, oh, I go, is, is she related? She goes, that's our daughter. And, and I'm done with my thing. <laughs> Your daughter you know, almost gonged us on the gong show, you know, like as a joke. Right. She, she scored. We she gave us a really low score, and and then the parents say, "Oh, well, she she was going through a tough time." I'm like, "Hey, I go. I was just kidding. I mean, we should have got. We should have been gone, whatever." But again, it's just another weird curveball. Out of that's all that. amazing. Isn't that's that it's so interesting. Oh, it's so weird. But but I get it because sometimes things like that in life just. You know, they just connect. I, I, I have what I have one for you. And, and I might leave this in. I might not. I've, I think I've told it before. But um, when I was 18, I was on The Price is Right. That was my first game show. And I flew to California for my birthday, got on the show, met Bob Barker, had an incredible time. 
I got shown a car that I eventually didn't win, but you know, they opened the doors and there's a model that's, you know, de- you know, demonstrating the car and kind of stroking in and waving at it, whatever they do. Um, around that time, I was working with my dad in public access TV in Connecticut, and I was doing his art instructional show, but I was also sort of on call. So when another production needed like a camera guy or a switcher, soundboard operator, you know, they would call me and I was 16, 17. There was a show that was all about um, the nation of Islam. There was some sort of sermon every, I think it was Thursday or Friday night for an hour. This guy from the nation of Islam would talk, you know, straight to the camera. Um, It turns out that the model who showed off the car for me at The Price is Right was his daughter. And I didn't find out until later. Yeah. He came to me afterwards and said, I saw you met my daughter. And I said, (laughs) who is your daughter? He said, she works on The Price is Right. Isn't that incredible how things like that just just intertwine? Which which model was it? Uh, Her name was Fire Dawson. Fire with a P-H. P-H-I-R-E. Because I remember the few the few of the models back, you know, their names and uh, I, I saw the documentary of the the of the um, uh, prices right with the one guy who um, was incredible who knew all the prices. Oh was, yeah, like, it was incredible. I I actually got to interview uh, not only the guy, the guy who gave the perfect bid, but the guy who said he was in the audience and had been in the audience for years and memorized all the prices. I got to talk to both of them, uh, which was interesting in in a lot of ways that. I, I won't necessarily get into here, but yeah, that was, they were two very fascinating people. Another small world. It's funny. So, so after I was in publishing, when I got out of high school, I was a, a rep, sold all, all the bookstores in Southern California and up in uh, Nevada, Arizona. Right. And after that, I became a meteorologist for the National Weather Service. And um, I did a lot of work with the media. And then the other funny thing is I worked with Rich Fields, who was, one, I guess, one of the spokes guys for The Price is Right. Oh, for um, years. Yeah, for years. I I, I, I I met him when I went to go see the show. Yep. Yeah. So I've known Rich for a while because we worked together in, in, you know, in the National Weather Service and when he was doing the weather for uh, CBS in L.A. Wonderful. So, yeah, he just released yeah. a book recently, too. He just wrote a book. I, yeah, I saw that, too. I, I haven't read it, but I, I, you know, I definitely saw it. Um, right, right, right. So, yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else that was kind of fascinating from it. Um, and, and again, like, you know, people will out of the blue, I'll get like a Facebook thing about the gong show or I'll, I'll, I may post a video of it for some reason and people react to it again, just kind of fun to, to, you know, to bring it back after so many years. Absolutely. Um, and to track the popularity of it because the gong show wasn't in reruns until the nineties until game show network came around. And now all of a sudden they're sort of unearthing all these shows. So I imagine um, there was an uptick in your recognition, maybe around that time that it sort of dipped for a while. You're, and you're then, right. what, yeah, you're, like once the awareness of the show came back, people started seeing you more and maybe. I mean, you, know, you go on, yeah, you. I would go on YouTube and there'd be like uh, some kids in Reno, Nevada were doing the worm and they were kind of, you know, mimicking what we were doing. It's just so funny to see that. It's unbelievable. I'll it's, tell you my, my, um, my hypothesis before I talk to you um, about the origin of the worm, I'll tell you what I thought it was. Mm-hmm. My my wife and I, for different reasons, are big fans of Soupy Sales. Yep. The the TV comedian, all he did all kinds of things. But he had a dance record in the 60s called The Mouse. And I thought that what you guys did, because of the sound of the song, it had that sort of 50s dance sound to it. Four chords, yeah. Just kind right, of right, right. I, I thought for that reason, I thought maybe it was a sort of takeoff or satire of that 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 kind of fad dance and it was like your version of it it was like a sort of uh, deconstructionist mouse <laughs> well the one thing that we knew that whatever was whatever we had to do we had to do it before 30 seconds like otherwise you know we had to do something so we knew that we had to drop to the ground before the 30 seconds otherwise we, we definitely would have been gone and again we should have been gone anyway but we knew that so we kind of you know we made we made the lyrics up as we went um, you know, stupid, just really easy lyrics and stuff. But, you know, again, it was a four chord beat that I, you know, we put together and, um, you know, it just, it's just funny how, how, how that just kind of happened to be. Right. And the other funny thing is when you look at like TV shows, like my name is Earl, all of a sudden I remember watching that and they said, Hey man, we're going to be late. We got to go to that wedding and do the worm, you know? And, and then you would mm-hmm. see it on another show or like parks and rec, um, you know, they had some worm reference and, you know, here and there we would hear the worms, you know, like we've got to do the worm, you know, this or that, whatever. It's right, just... right, right. Wow. That's and, and you know, it's funny. I think over the years 
the the idea of the worm has sort of been streamlined. I can't do it, but I've seen people do this thing where they kind of flop on their belly and they make like a they almost look like a like a snake. They go up and down. Yeah, and, like, and so, like an inch worm thing. That yeah. right, right, right. But I'm I'm now talking to the the uh, uh the originator of the worm, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the well, sort of I, the prototype. Know, I, think that, I remember though. I remember seeing that like like you were saying, people get on their stomach and kind of do the worm, whatever. Ours is more of kind of a seizure on the ground. And that you know, when Animal House, when they did the gator, they did it to the T. That that was the worm. Right. Um, when, you, when you watch Animal House, when they do the toga dance, and they drop, you know, do the gator. That's what they called it. And um, yeah, it was it was pretty interesting for sure. But um, totally enjoyable. It's fun to, you know, again, see things. And again, TV shows today, they'll reference it now and then. And th- another funny thing, my cousin sends me an email, says or text. He says, hey, man, I just saw you on, on a game show um, special on ABC. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And apparently ABC did a little documentary, little, what, a five or six hour thing um, with the, like the game shows. You probably saw it. I, sure I, I, actually, I was in it. Oh, <laughs> Not really? pre- yeah, they interviewed me. I was in, I was in a couple episodes of that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'll have to watch it again. But the worms were on it. You know, they they show the, us doing the worms. And they're right. talking to Jerry afterwards uh, about, you know, the gong. It was the gong show. It was episode two, I think, is what it was. Okay. Then, right. Yeah. Cause that kind of, yeah. Episode two of the documentary kind of focused on like talent shows and things like yeah, that. Chuck Barris. Yeah. Right. Kind of. Right. Right. And yeah. it's funny, Kurt, your act is to me, just from what I know about TV and about game shows and all that, you know, to me, your act is, is emblematic of that era of TV. There is a certain magical window in the history of TV where a person can go audition for a show get on stage in front of the audience, the cameras, celebrities, and just flop on the floor like they're having a seizure and become a star. There's a there's a few years where that was allowed, and it's a, it's a kind of fun that doesn't really exist on TV anymore. It, it's, a very, it's a very precious moment, I think, because you can't do that these days. There's all kinds of, oh. I mean, you know, they'll edit the hell out of it, and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you to hurry up, and, it, you know, it, it's just so freewheeling. And because you're having fun, everybody what I, I got I was a wedding DJ for for a while. And I kind of do it sort of friends only now. I remember my first wedding, I was so nervous because I was afraid that I was gonna mess it up. I was afraid people you know weren't gonna like it. And a friend of mine who also did similar things told me, if you have fun, they will have fun. And that has right. become this sort of guiding philosophy for me throughout all the things that I'm doing creatively. If it sounds and looks like you're having fun, the people watching you will have fun as well. It's just it's a it's it's science. It's it's contagious. That kind of fun, and it, to, to me, your act is a perfect example of that. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. Um, so the weird thing is, I saw on Facebook um, that there was a, I, there was a lot of posts on Gong Show stuff, and that's how that's how I think your name, uh, I, my name, got to you was the author, who I just literally got the book the other day. I just started reading him on like page fifty now. Right, Adam um, Needif, Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's he's a great I, author. He's written a lot of books. Absolutely. And, and I have the book and it, it's funny. I wish, gosh, I wish he would have, I wish I would have known about it. I would have reached out in a heartbeat um, to, to talk with him uh, about, you know, the gong show and what at least, you know, again, we did it like 11 times and then we did the rah-rah show. And the other, that, that's the other funny thing on the rah-rah show. I mean, you know, we were literally right after Ray Charles. I mean, think about that. A bunch of idiots out there doing, you know, uh, the worm and we're on after, uh, Ray Charles um, for our act, um, unbelievable. Which got, which got cut. I mean, we didn't. You know, we did it. Tw- we did the show twice, and for whatever reason, we got cut cut from the show. Um, but um, uh, do oh, me then, a favor, Kurt. Tell me what the Chuck Barris Rah Rah show was. I'm familiar with the name, but I've never yeah, seen it. What it was, was a, that? It was a variety show of um, you know legitimate celebrities and some gong show acts. Basically, that's all it was. Where the, you know, the dirt band would be on there. The nitty gritty dirt band. Johnny Paycheck was on um, Ray Charles. Mabel King was singing. Um, I, I think J.P. Morgan, you know, just some like there were some big names, but there was a lot of diesel, you know, D-list celebrities, I guess, whatever on there and stuff. So but, you know, Ray Charles, I mean, that you know, a legend and stuff was on there. And literally we were on after him. They brought us on stage and we were just kind of like, can you believe, it? you know, it was just such a weird weird surreal time 
um, for sure. Right. So, I can't imagine you ever thought that would be your position in life to open for Ray Charles. <laughs> I mean, it's just so bizarre. And, um, and yeah, we were after him. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, you don't want to follow Ray Charles. Well, here we are. And, you know, of course we got cut from it anyway, but um, you know, then the movie, the, the movie came out and, and we had no idea about the movie being made. I didn't know. know oh, about the Gong Show movie. Right. Yeah. You know, so again, you know, a little disappointed that we didn't get a call. See, there, there it is again. We knew we sucked, but it's like, hey, you know, we did the show eleven times. You know, come on, why, why didn't we get a call to be on that? So, um, you know, it was kind of fun. So when they actually brought, when they did the opening, um, at, it was at Grauman's, I think they did the opening, and they actually brought a limo for for the worms to come walk on the red carpet. Um, when, oh, when, how incredible! It was fun. Yeah, it was. It was really good. We're in our long underwear. And again, you know, we put on weight since, you know, since we were in high school a little bit. So it was kind of funny to see us in, you know, long underwear uh, was clinging quite tight, at least for me anyway. Right. Um, <laughs> getting into the 80s, whatever. So, um, but it was fun. And, yeah. And if you, again, as I mentioned before, I did a few other sh- game shows, which um, um, we did. I did a show called Hot Potato. Um, with Bill Cullen. Do you remember Hot Potato? I do. It was uh, two teams of three of a kind. And it was it was, it was almost like Family Feud. You had to kind of knock off the answers on a list. Well, yeah. And if I don't want to digress and go on to that, but it was interesting. It's okay. Um, our threesome, we were beer taste testers. Um, I worked for Anheuser-Busch um, doing, like going to bars and making sure their beer was fresh and good and changing out kegs. And the weird thing was, I wasn't 21. <laughs> I was not 21 yet. And I remember I'm drinking a beer, making sure, you know, I was subcontracted by them. So we would go to, to different bars in Hollywood and LA and the Valley and just make sure their beer was fresh and cleaned up, whatever. Sure, sure, sure. So that was our act, uh, or that's the three of us we did. And, you know, we, we, won the, we won the show. We screwed up on the big money. Um, which was stupid looking back. What the, the question was, what are there more of radiologists or anesthesi- anesthesiologists? And we said radiologists, which if you know, you would have asked me that now, obviously it was an easy answer, but um, we got it wrong. But the interesting thing was one of the questions for uh, the other co- the other team was name seven states that start with letter M. So in that case, you know, you, there's definitive answers. Whereas with us, it's like, you know, name seven sticky substances, you know, whatever. Um, so it's not definitive. So we lost that game. And I remember we asked, hey, that doesn't seem fair. Because what they did is after the sixth one, they went to a commercial. So that team had a whole minute to think about it. Oh, okay. They, so anyway, the nice thing was they called us back. And we we lost to um, fathers, which seemed like inevitable, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> for the religious aspect of it. So. Yeah, so, I'm, so right, and 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 I'll also say, Kurt, one of the things I've learned in doing this podcast and just being a game show fan in general and engaging in so many of these discussions, there is no such thing as too much detail. So anything you remember about these oh. experiences is fair game. And I will also say, especially with regard to Hot Potato, because Bill Cullen is a person who holds a great deal of significance among a lot of game show fans. Yes. And any around, opportunity. Yeah. Oh God, he's, he's, well, he's like the Dean of game shows. I think he was known as for, you know, yeah. for, for a long time. Uh, what do you remember about, about being near bill and dealing with him? Well, I remember that we never, i never saw him move from where he was. I, I know, I think he was polio. He had something, but he was, he was right. staged behind the counter and he never moved from there. Um, at least when we were up there, I never saw him. Um, move away from there so that that's the one thing but yeah he was you know old school um you know fun um it was a good it was a good time he was really good at what he did um you know um it was interesting it was fun and uh, again we, we could have won we screwed up uh, to win the big money but um now another fun story is i um won a honeymoon to fiji um on classic concentration with alex trebek Oh, what a great show. That's a show that just got back into reruns, too. I'm seeing that all over the place. Yeah. And and I, I the weird thing is I don't remember if they had all the cars lined up. I, I don't maybe they did. I don't remember. But I I remember we I won one game. So I won a pool table and a, um, my trip to Fiji, by the way, was another game, which was Chris, which was Crosswits. I'm getting my game shows confused. Oh, that's um, OK. The Crosswits was that. Um, 
There was the one in the seventies with Jack Clark, and no, then there was the one later, later. Yeah, my was some, David Sparks, I think, was the host. Oh, okay, the eighties version. Yep, I remember that. Yeah, that's yeah. one of my first memories of TV is watching reruns of that version of CrossFit. Oh, God, I remember. I was so embarrassed. I screwed up. Um, you know, I ended up winning the the game, but there was a game that you know you had to. They gave you like words, and then the words in the cross uh, word puzzle. There was a theme to it. And and the theme was yo-yo, and I could not figure it out. And I and I have Rob. I was playing with Robert Klein um, um, from um, is it Richard or Robert? I get the Kleins mixed up. The comedian and um, the one from the Regal Beagle. Um, oh, I think that's Richard Klein. Richard Klein. So he's my partner, and I remember the pressure. He was like going, "Come on, man, what is it?" You know, like when I had to do the theme, and it's like, "Come on, you know this." I'm like, oh my God, I just felt so bad. So I lost that game. We ended up winning two of the three. So we were playing for the big puzzle and and uh, Richard Klein and I were doing it and we were going pretty well. And then it got, it got weird at the end. We were probably not going to hit it, but the puzzle popped up. Like I said, the right answer. And I didn't, but because they screwed it up, they gave us, they gave us the prize, which was the trip to Fiji. Um, so that was kind of cool. I was playing with Edie McClurg and, and Richard Klein. Um, Wow, then, that's a very '80s team of game oh, show celebrities. Yeah. And then <laughs> and, and Stephen Bishop was on the other team, um, and I remember I, I had a chance to win a car, and I just picked the wrong person. I, um, I, I did want to go for the Chevy Blazer, and my wife had her her hands up like go for the Rabbit. So I took Stephen Bishop, and it was the Blazer. <laughs> so oh, that's too we bad. Just, yeah, we were we were just getting married, um, so you know. Right, right, right. Yeah. Mine, uh, my car on the Price is Right that I lost was a Pontiac Vibe. And to this day, a lot of my friends say, by not winning that car, I was, in fact, the winner. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I mean, it's fun to look back at some of the products and the cars and things, too. We, Me and my wife, we watch all the time. Let me ask you a question. I do have a question, and I don't, I'll never understand this for as long as I live. Sure. Why they don't do blind bids um, for the opening, you know, when you get the four contestants up there? Why, why, why they don't all bid like separately. Right. Yeah. That would be really interesting. Well, I, mean, I know that. I mean, like the seventies version is uh, an, an update of the one that was on in the fifties and you, you know, with, it was hosted by Bill Cullen and that game, you could just keep bidding until the buzzer sounds. Everybody would take turns bidding. Then they go back down the line again and their bids would increase and increase and increase until you want to freeze. Mm -hmm. And then you hear that bell, which now when you hear the bell on the Price is Right when they give their bid, that's them freezing their bid. That's a callback to the 50s version. So I think they're just trying to keep the strategy of that. But I also think that over a period of 50 years, that game has been solved a little bit. There's a way yes. to, you know, there's a, uh, if, if you know what you're doing, and that's the case with a lot of the Price is Right. If you know what you're doing and you know how to work the numbers and you you have an idea of the pattern. Which I'm sure you know from watching the documentary. I mean, there 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 are patterns right. that come up in those prices. If you know how to work it, you can play that game really, really well. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And, and, and what's so funny about it is, even though even though it's been on the air so many times, and people have, they still like you know the last bidder. I mean, just like <laughs> you think they would go either a buck above or go for a buck, whatever, or just you know, I mean, bid bid smart. But boy, you see some of these crazy dumb moves. But right. Well, and it happens. I, and, and and this is something that I don't understand either. It happens more now that Drew Carey is the host. There are a lot of silly bids and people that don't know how to play the game, don't know what they're doing. Whereas I feel like when Bob Barker was the host, there was a certain respect for the show and respect for the game. Almost like you didn't want to disappoint him. I don't know if that's true or if that holds any water, but the contestants nowadays are sillier. And and less uh, in tune with the game than they were back then. Yeah, I mean, just based on the bidding, I, right. I would agree. I, it's just it's just crazy. I, right, right. You know, but I, I I enjoy it. I you know I, again watching just watching the the game show network, going back to some of the older ones and stuff, and uh, um, you know you know the the things I don't know how you. I'm curious, like like a, a show like Deal or No Deal. Right. I I would much love I would much rather love that show if they would just go to picking as opposed to the backstories. Oh, that's that is a um that's a qualm that a lot of the people who like that kind of TV like me yeah. and, and and my friends have. Give me one second. 
<clears throat> excuse me. Um, yes, that is a qualm that a lot of us have. And if you look to if you look to foreign versions of the show, because Deal or No Deal originated in the UK. If you look at it, if you look at the original versions and some of the adaptations, I'm thinking of uh, there's one in Australia, there's one in the UK. I'm sure there are mm-hmm. others. They play the game. It fits into half an hour. They and and for and and I'm using I'm putting game in quotes because it's not a whole lot of game. I mean, you're picking numbers and kind of right. just deciding when to say when. But there isn't that drama that they fold into it. Not everybody has a a a a a, a, a sob worthy backstory. Which is my personal um, gripe with a lot of game shows these days. That it's it, like the wall. It's the same thing with the wall. Yes, exactly. And the it's wall is—it's nice a done. fun game. Yeah, Great absolutely. Game. I love watching this. I love it. But when I, they get all sappy and stuff, and it's just like, oh god. And they play it in slow motion when they, God, just drop the balls. Let's get on with it. Right. You know? Exactly. Exactly. And sometimes I wonder if it's to, if it's to fit in that hour window that they have to like inject some other. Probably yeah. into it, Probably. but yeah. I mean, these games, if they don't, I don't know if I'm a producer and I have a game and the game doesn't sustain an hour, I might look at the game and figure out how to get it to sustain an hour rather than inject all kinds of other sort of artifice into it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the other game I love is pyramid. Oh, um, it's a great game. I That's love a great that. Game. Show. Yeah. I, just, yeah. That is word yeah. communication as a sport. I love that game. Me too. That, yeah. that's, what, that's what I should have said earlier, but yes. Yeah, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful show. So I got I have to give a shout out to Adam Needis because he brought us together. He wrote yeah. what is now the definitive history of the Gong Show. And I think in that yeah. process, uh, somehow, I don't know if he reached out to you or you reached out to him. But... I reached out to, I, basically, I saw a post on Facebook and I'm like, whoa, this is awesome. And right. So I went back. I just I responded to one and say, "Hey, I'm Kurt from the Worms," and it was nice. Got a nice response from a lot of people. And he said, "Oh God, you know, great." And he gave me his email or whatever to 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 send him an email and catch up with him. He says, "I felt bad. I wish I would have known um, you, you know, before I wrote this book, whatever." And I'm like, oh, "That's all right, you know." It's you know, I, I I'm fascinated by the Gong Show too, so I'm I'm reading it. I'm on, like I said, fate, page fifty eight now, and I just literally got it the other day, so I'll finish it in the next day or two. Excellent. Yeah, and he's a he's a researcher with the National Archives of Game, of Game Show History. So I'm going to take uh, that again. He's a researcher I, with the National Archives of Game Show History, for whom I'm doing you know this podcast now. Um, right. I've known Adam for years. Adam introduced me indirectly to my wife because oh. they it, it's oh, let's okay another 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 story of little fibers in life intertwining. Um, Adam. And my wife have a connection to Conan O'Brien. My oh. wife is the biggest Conan O'Brien fan there is. She has a tattoo of Conan on her. I think it's her left or it's one of her shins, but she yeah. has a tattoo of him. Adam um, was working at Madame Tussauds Wax Museum years ago. Conan did a remote segment where he was led through the museum and kind of riffed on the statues and that. But Adam was the one who led him through. So because of that mutual connection, um, Adam was the only mutual friend her and I had on Facebook. So based on that, she added me on Facebook. We started talking and now we've been married for, it'll be eight years this March. Was that in LA or was that when he was in New York? That was in LA. That was in LA. Okay. And then a few years later, I got to meet Adam in person for the first time. And I got to sort of thank him for introducing me, you know, to my wife. <laughs> Wow, how bizarre! Yeah. Oh, it's um, it's such a small world. It's in, right. and then to the you know to to fast forward and have this connection now through this museum thing and the podcast is just unbelievable. That's good. My son, my son was a child actor. Um, my son now is thirty three, and he was a uh, he did a lot of TV and a couple of movies, and he, he's very good friends um, with Nick Braun um, from um, you know the big show. Um, Oh gosh, the HBO show Succession. Oh right, I I haven't seen Succession, but I'm I, I've heard his name. Oh, yeah, so he did a lot. He did a lot of TV shows, and they were friends growing up. And they they did a little viral thing that I mean a little before before the Succession. And my my son Kyle, who's been on like Hannah Montana and Zoe One Hundred and One, um, and a couple of movies. He was he was on Bernie Mac. Did a lot of different things there, and a couple of pilots that didn't go. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of fun that he, you know, he was doing that. Now he's in the music. Now he's doing electronic music. My son. Oh, and that's so fun! Wonderful. Yeah, he's doing well. he's sure, doing well. sure. One of the things I've noticed, Kurt, from having all these conversations with 
former contestants. And I have talked to people that were on shows, on rigged quiz shows in the 50s. I've talked to people who won millions of dollars and I've talked to people who've lost millions of dollars. Um, the one oh. commonality, the one commonality I found is that it is always fun to talk about no matter how long it's yes. been, no matter what the outcome of the game was, whether you won, whether you lost, whatever, it's always fun to talk about. Isn't that, isn't that true? It's, I love it. Yeah, I do. And, and again, me and my wife, you know, we love game shows. We love watching whatever, but again, just in the streets when someone would say something like, Hey, you remember the gong show? And then I can say, Oh yeah. Um, you know, I was on that, whatever. And then what'd you do? We did the worm. Oh my God. You guys were, it's cool. It's fun. They know it. You know, they remember there's some acts that they remember. Tell us about yourself. Conversations with Game Show Contestants is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Christian Carrion, from my studio in beautiful downtown Lancaster City, Pennsylvania. Co-executive producer, Corey Anatata. Researcher, Chuck Donegan. This has been a production of Buzzerblog, the most popular game show website in the world, in partnership with the National Archives of Game Show History at the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. For more information, visit museumofplay.org. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Christian Carrion. Good night. Tell us about yourself. Conversations with Game Show Contestants is produced in partnership with the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. One of the largest history museums in the United States and one of the leading museums serving families with highly interactive exhibits and programs. Since 1968, the Strong Museum has been dedicated to exploring the ways in which play encourages learning, creativity, and discovery and how it illuminates cultural history. And their National Archives of Game Show History. Founded by industry veterans Bob Bowden and Howard Blumenthal, the archive is home to thousands of artifacts representing over 80 years of broadcasting, including props, set designs, video interviews with game show professionals, and other iconic elements from the history of television at play. For more information about the National Archives of Game Show History or the Strong National Museum of Play, visit museumofplay.org or call area code 585-263-2700. Tell Us About Yourself is sponsored by bonusround.ca, streaming Canada's classic game shows on demand. Dive into the golden age of television with thousands of episodes of Canadian series that defined an era from anywhere in the world, all for just $1.99 a month. From iconic shows like Let's Make a Deal and Definition to cult classics like Bumper Stumpers and The Mad Dash, BonusRound.ca brings you timeless entertainment that's fun, enlightening, and affordable. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, relive the magic of Canadian television history. Subscribe now at bonusround.ca for $1.99 and turn every night into game show night. And by The Inn at Leola Village. Nestled in the heart of picturesque Pennsylvania, The Inn at Leola Village is a sanctuary of luxury and relaxation. Indulge in the timeless beauty of their historic suites, each meticulously designed to transport you to a bygone era of elegance and grace. Experience the culinary delights of their award-winning Italian restaurant, where every dish is a masterpiece crafted from the finest local ingredients. From romantic getaways to corporate retreats, the Inn at Leola Village offers a haven for every occasion. Unwind at the spa, stroll through the lush gardens, and let the stress of everyday life melt away. Make your reservation today at theinnatleolavillage.com or call the front desk at area code 717-656-7002. The Inn at Leola Village, an oasis of luxury.